I, I do want to share something with you that the Lord dropped in my heart the other day that, you know, there are times when I know that I've got a word that God has given me that is a right now where you just know that. And then there are other times then you, you, you think you may, but you're not sure. And then other times you hope so. And then there are other times you just talk and hope that somebody gets something. Uh, so, but but uh, I don't know who this is for, but the Lord just prompted me on Friday, and uh, we're going to come back to we're going to come back to the story we're in two weeks ago, the last time that we were together with me here, uh, and then share something with you God dropped on me. Okay, look at somebody and smile at them and tell them the Father knows right where you are, and He has been anticipating. good things for you. He's anticipating good things. So I want you to just uh, begin to read with me Luke 15, 11. If you got the right Bible, we're on page 907. And he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. And he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country, and there he squandered his estate with loose living. And while, or now when he had spent everything that he had, a severe famine occurred in that land, and he began to be in need or in lack. And he went and attached himself or sold himself literally as a slave is the, the, the original intent here to one of the citizens of that country and he sent him in his into his fields to feed swine and as he was longing to fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating no one was giving anything to him I want you to look at somebody and tell them the days of people not investing in your purpose are coming to an end Look at him and say, furthermore, the days of your desires being denied are closing. Nobody was feeding him. But when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread and I'm dying here with hunger I will get up and go to my father and I'll say to him father I've sinned against heaven and in your sight and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son make me as one of your hired men and he got up and came to his father but while he was still a long way off his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quickly, shout quickly. quickly. Shout that again, quickly. quickly. Quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let, let us eat and have a celebration, for my son was dead, but he's come back to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing, and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things might be. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in, and his father came out and began to beg him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I've been serving you. I have never neglected a command of yours, and yet you've never given me a kid or a fattened calf that I could have a celebration with my friends. But when this your son, who has devoured your wealth with harlots, when he's come home, you've killed the fattened calf for him. And he, meaning the father, said to him, My son, you always are with me, and everything I have is yours. But 
but we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live. He was lost and has been found. I want you to read that last part of that verse with me out loud. And was lost and has been found. In Zechariah 8, chapter 2, the Lord says to the nation of Israel, in connection to their being restored completely out of Babylonian captivity, he said, I am jealous over you with godly zeal. And what the Lord dropped in my spirit on Friday for someone, and uh, and I really believe this is a word for somebody either in the room or watching. The Lord, the Father himself wants you to know to not misinterpret the signs of what you're seeing because he himself is personally changing things because the Father has declared over your life he is jealous over you with a passion that he will not be talked out of. I don't know if it has to do with a personal battle you're in, a struggle you've been through, some regrets that are weighing on you, some challenges that are before you, or just a fear that the enemy's been trying to feed you with. That because of what you're dealing with, whether it's delayed desire and nobody will feed your dream or it seems like he's not answering your prayer, or it seems like you're going down a path that's taking you far away from all of the things you believed God was going to do through your life. You need to know that you may have felt cut off and lost, but heaven has declared over your life prophetically, I am jealous over her. I am jealous over him. And in the context of Zechariah 8 verse 2, God was giving them that as faith and confidence and strategy to build with so that they would have courage. Watch this. So, so that they could know that God himself had decreed that the former seasons, the former struggles, the former issues, and the accusations of enemies would not change what he was doing now and that he was personally getting involved in their fight and that he was going to defend his cause on their behalf. Just like the, older, the father does with the older brother, he's saying to him when he complains and says, Your son hated your guts, wasted your money. The reference to the prostitutes is a direct appeal to the father's holiness. And he's saying, Dad, you've got to understand, this, my younger brother, your son, who hated you, spent what cost you everything to earn he paid no price for and then wasted it in the most debauched lifestyle that contradicts the very nature of who you are. And in that context, without using the same words that God used in Zechariah 8, Jesus, through the parable of the father, has the father respond to the older son by saying, I am jealous over your brother. Leave him alone. How do we know that? Because the father is defending the younger son's right to wear the robe, to wear the ring, and to have a new pair of shoes. Now that may not mean a whole lot in our contemporary American culture, but those three items represented an upgrade in the authority and responsibility level of that younger son in the father's house that the father was saying, I am jealous over him, and I'm not just going to restore him to an old identity, but I'm going to give him an upgrade. Look at somebody and tell him, the father's jealous over you, and he's bringing you into some upgrades. He's bringing you into some upgrades. Upgrades. What's an upgrade? What's an upgrade? I want you to take a second and think about 
where you are at this time in your life. Your battles, your fears, your enemies. I want you to take an inventory of the warfare you've been experiencing. Now, I can tell by the reaction in the room. Oh, I was misinterpreting. I thought there wasn't anybody battling anything. I just thought, well, we're all good. Let's, you know, the Lord bless and keep you. Let's do, let's go home. So. The son's in a, he's in a pig pen. It took a lot for him to come home. But he does so with diminished expectations. It's amazing how our journey, even when we know who the father is. He knew who his father was. In fact, I would submit to you that what Jesus is teaching to the Pharisees and the sinners who are present in that, the mix of that audience, Jesus is laying out a case that even in his rebellion and sin and debauchery, the younger son had a revelation of who their father was, that even the proximity of the older brother, he's close, but he's unaware. Because the younger son, when he came to his senses, Jesus said, my father knows how to treat people. Listen to what the younger son said. I know I can go home and find acceptance because I know how my father treats even his hired help, people he has no investment or obligation to meet their needs. He treats them better. Now watch this. Watch, I want to break this down. He treats them better than other employers in our community. And it's because of that he has an understanding of the nature of his father. Yet through all of that, he doesn't come home asking for his sonship back. Why? He understands who his father is, but his journey has diminished his own sense of identity and worth. You see our journeys, whether it's outright stupid stuff. Let me see your hand if you've graduated from the school of doing outright stupid stuff. You, you graduated, you've moved on. Now, yeah, exactly, exactly. No, no hands going up. Mine is hypothetically, but, you know, it's just as an example to encourage others. But, uh, you know, so, so we still from time to time take a few classes in that school sometimes. So sometimes, no, seriously, sometimes we just do outright stupid stuff. By stupid stuff, I mean you don't mean to be rebellious. You just don't think it through, or you get impatient, or it's been so long that you just kind of think, well, maybe God didn't really mean that when he said it or he's changed his mind. Or maybe you've just been beaten down. By disappointment, by warfare, by enemies, by closed doors. But regardless of why you are where you are, you find yourself wallowing in some things. I want you to smile, look at somebody and tell them, I stopped wallowing years ago. I never wallow in doubt. I never wallow in confusion. I never wallow in frustration. Ever since I got saved, I've never wallowed in sin. Judy, you're welcome to take the mic back at any time. You hear what I'm saying? Regardless of what, regardless of what you've wallowed in, eventually it will, if you're not careful, it will diminish you. And diminished expectations have no place in the kingdom. And what God wants us to know about his jealousy over us is that even when we are the creator, implementer, producer, marketer, salesperson of our mess, when we can honestly say, Nobody else did this. This is, this is all me. 
God says, you know what? I can still do something yeah. with you. And I am jealous over who I know I've been making you to be. And I know that eventually I put something in you that's going to pull you back. And though you were lost, you're going to be found. See, I want to tell you something today. You have a GPS. God's positioning system. My son was lost, but now he is found. Watch this. Watch this. See, the father is so jealous over you that he puts something in you that pulls you through the mess and pulls you through the storm and pulls you through the warfare and pulls you through all of the stuff that you end up found even though he doesn't go looking for you. If you pull back and if you know the 15th chapter, before Jesus, he tells three parables of, of lost things. A coin, a sheep, and a son. In the first two, with the sheep and the coin, the person who lost it went looking for it. But when it comes to the younger brother, the father doesn't go looking. Yet he says to the older brother, when he's jealously protecting his younger son's future, what does he say to him? He was lost, but has been found. No, no, that almost sounds like a contradiction. So what is Jesus talking about there? Because it's clear in the first two, the person who lost what mattered to them went and searched until they found it. Do you think that a coin mattered more to a woman or that a sheep mattered more to a shepherd than a son mattered to a father? Then why does Jesus be intentional about saying the father doesn't go to seek the son? The Lord is cluing us in to the fact that when he comes into our lives, the Father puts something in us. That's his GPS, God's positioning system, so that even when we're lost, we're found. He knows where you are, and he put it in you that's going to pull you through it and pull you to the place he needs you to be. And when you get there, no matter of the diminished expectations you may carry because of the length or the depth of the journey, when you get there, you come into upgrades because he's jealous over you. So the challenge of faith today, if that's where you've been through, is to suspend all the facts and information and reality you have that want to argue you out of. What do I mean by argue you? You know those internal conversations? If you've figured out a way to stop having those with yourself, then I want to I want to give you a conference and you can teach us. We'll pay you money to come and listen to you give us strategies and tools to be able to get beyond that. You 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 You've got facts. But I'm here today to tell you facts aren't necessarily the truth. You got realities. But they may not they may not be an indicator of your final outcome. I am jealous over him. The father is saying through the conversation to the older brother. I'm as jealous over him as I am over you. Now, I want you to contemplate what it means that the Father is jealous over you. That means that GPS you have in you that you didn't even know it was there. That's Him in you. In this particular scenario, it was an understanding the younger brother has as to who his father is. Where did that come from? Relationship. But there's also a DNA thing. How many of you have been shocked to discover that as you get a few more miles on your tires, so to speak, you see things about your parents showing up just automatically in you? Ways you look, expressions. You ever done that? You looked in the mirror and see expressions like, oh, my God, where did that come from? I, didn't, I wasn't practicing that. Phrases. Well, watch this. 
the way of handling a problem. Thinking. How you deal with people. How you treat your kids, your grandkids, or other you know, important relationships in your life. How you look. Let me see your hand if you've practiced all those things so you could be just like your parents. It's genetics. I would submit to you. I would submit to you that when you get born again, the DNA of the Spirit of God, what do you think it means that He lives in us? We are His dwelling place. You can't be born of something without carrying the genetic code of the Father. Everything has a code. Everything God creates has a code. That's why a seed, God can, God can predict the future by a seed. You plant a watermelon seed, you're not going to get a strawberry bush. Why? Genetic coding. You get born again by God's spirit, guess what happens? The totality of the kingdom of God is now alive in you. Jesus said, don't look out there because the kingdom of God is in you. What does that mean? That means every resource of who he is, that capacity dwells in us. It doesn't make life perfect. It doesn't make you Superman. I guess nowadays, that's an, that's an archaic, ancient, who's Superman? <laughs> Not in this room, but in you know, a lot of rooms is because of the, I guess now it's Avengers or something. I don't even know. The superhero thing. But literally, you have genetics in you that are spiritual that God put there. Whether you're aware of them or not. Whether you're aware that that's what God is using to pull you into your destiny. To move you into your future. That's why certain things wake up in you in certain seasons. In certain moments. That's why suddenly you'll begin to think thoughts you weren't thinking before. That begin to free you up. The son comes to himself. Did you, did you hear what Jesus said? When he came to his senses, it literally translates to himself. You can't have a self. You can't be a self without having been born from some other self. So when he comes to himself, do you know what he's doing? He doesn't even realize it because of his condition, but he's coming to a reality of his father. His father's waking up in him. God's put some things in you. Because he's jealous over you. And the journey will not take them from you. Doesn't mean it doesn't look like you've lost some things. It doesn't mean you haven't lost some things. What it means is when God says, I'm jealous over your life. I'm jealous over your future. I'm jealous over your destiny. I'm jealous over the investments I've been making in you. I'm jealous over the prophetic declarations. And though it may seem like decades... I got a GPS in your spirit. I've taken part of me and I've put it in you. And there's going to come a moment when me in you is going to wake up and pull you through the mess. And now bring you to a place where I revolutionize and begin to do things. Watch this. That your diminished expectations are no longer asking for. If you've never had prayer not go the way you thought it would, raise your hand. He comes home, and he says, Father, I'm no longer worthy. So look at somebody and tell them that, that means identity. He doesn't see himself. He doesn't see himself. I want to give you a phrase. This is so important. This is why the enemy hits you like he does. Identity is destiny. Identity is destiny. If you're not whole in your identity, your identity is who you are. You ever met somebody, you ask them, oh, oh, so who are you? And they start telling you all the things they do for a living. They're not telling you who they are. They're telling you what they do. Identity is destiny. So the son says, my identity, I used, I used to identify myself as a son of my father. Watch this. The beauty of God. Say this with me. Our God's not just faithful, he's beautiful. He's far more amazing than we often give him credit for. 
God's agenda is never our agenda. He says that in Isaiah 55. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. They're so much farther. They're at a level beyond anything you can. So you can't get there, so I put me in you. So I call me to me. And the me and you, that's the GPS. I call my spirit. I think, by the way, side note, I think I've got a revelation on how the church is going to get out of the earth when Jesus returns for us. I think I have an insight. I just can't find it in Scripture, but I think God gave me this one time years ago. I was struggling with the, the physics of the rapture, obviously. A little science nerd like me, not so much. But anyway, I was just curious, and I was thinking about it like, God, how's that going to work? And I felt like the Lord gave me an insight. And, uh, and I felt like what the Lord showed me was all I've got to do to get my church home is call my spirit home. And everybody who the spirit is in comes home. I said, okay, God, I'll take that. So I believe I, that's a personal thing I feel like the Lord showed me. I can't give you a chapter or verse. If he does it a different way, don't blame me. Just make sure you're there. <laughs> right? Let's just, you know, pastor, I was a little ticked off that Sunday, but we're here. I'm good. You know, let's go, let's go, let's go colonize Mars for Jesus. I mean, you know what I'm saying? But the point is, is that his spirit, when he, when he wanted the son to come home, the son comes to himself. The son came to the identity of who his father was. Because when he comes to himself, what does he begin to say? He doesn't talk about the things he used to do, the things he used to have. The, he talks about how his father, so he's really relating he, he, the image of his father. Look at somebody tell him the, the image of your father. The image of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are going to begin building a wholeness in you that are going to move you. That's God's positioning system. But even through that, he's diminished. And so what does the Father do? And I'm going to wrap this up. I want you to think about it. The Father does not restore him to his old identity. No, I mean, by old identity, I mean the level he was at as a son before he rebelled. He doesn't restore him to that. He puts sandals, a robe, and a ring on him that he'd never worn before, and they were nobody else's. They weren't the fathers. They weren't the sons. I may have mentioned this two weeks ago. I don't think I spent a ton of time on it, but, but I want you to understand this. Those were robes of reservation. That God, So the father had had those things waiting for him, Hold, hold on, God. Now, now you mean you're not going to give it to me in that season I'm doing right, or that you're not going to, well, I'm going to give it to the right brother over here because he never does anything wrong. Look at somebody and tell them the Father's far more invested than in you than and emotionally covenanted with. There, so we talk about the covenants of God. Let me just, let me just show you. God has an emotional covenant with you. He is relationally, emotionally invested in who you are, not what you do. He can work on what you do. When he gets up in you, he'll work on what you do. It's who you are. When he looks at you, he sees Jesus. Think about that for a minute. How long has it been since you really thought about the fact that when the Father looks at me, he sees Jesus? When the Father looked at the Son, When the father looks at the son and he puts that stuff on him, those were all, by the way, I'm not going to get into this, a whole, different, a whole different teaching, but each of those were symbols of authority and governance. They were keys to financial decisions. They were keys to leadership. I mean, it's a whole... It's, this is why the brother is so ticked at how he's treating, because he's saying, you've given him things you've never given me. But as it relates to what the father is doing for the younger son, he is jealous over him to the extent that he says, I want this to happen quickly. He's struggling in his identity. Make it happen quickly. Not, well, you're going to have to, I want you to go work for your older brother for two years. And then let's see how you do. Did you get that sin out of your life? 
let's see if the root of rebellion has really been severed or, or if there's still some issues and the father's not evaluating. You know, as human beings, we, we have agendas and we kind of play games. Well, I don't know if I can trust this. Here's somebody tell them, you may not be able to trust a lot of people in your life, but you can trust the Father. And what, you, what I'm encouraging you to do today is in spite of whatever level of struggle you've had because of dimin with diminished expectations because of whatever journey you've been on or whatever your journey has done to you. The Father is jealous. over what he has planned with you and the journey won't change it. All of those items had been in the house waiting for the son not to come home but to come into a season. Where the father says, you know, I'm ready to upgrade you. I want, to I want to challenge your faith. I'm not saying it's easy. You know, faith doesn't make things easy. I wish it did. You know, what was easy when I was a kid, how many, of, how many of you remember the Lucky Rabbit's Foot? Remember they would sell them in the convenience stores? And Man, when I was eight or nine years old, I worked that thing to death. And then you'd, you'd go into a little mini emotional crisis if you couldn't find your Lucky Rabbit's Foot. If you lost it. That ever happen to y'all? I, st I tell way too many personal stories that aren't relevant for anybody. They're still around, but, but you know, it's not you know rub it, that it's not easy. Faith doesn't make things easy; it makes things possible. And God will never call you to rise up in faith to meet Him at a level He's not already got things waiting and ready for you to meet Him at. That's the GPS. It's really, you don't even get that faith on your own. He gives it to you and then develops you and then you begin to learn to walk with it. Work with it. So the challenge of faith, the thing I want to challenge your faith with today is to ask yourself this question, not just you, but really begin asking the Holy Spirit, Lord, what is it that's so next level that you want to upgrade me into that I don't have a frame of reference for it but by faith I've got to bridge the gap to get there even in those seasons when God says be still and know I'm God that's not passive faith that's active faith because when you got to train yourself by faith to be still that's some of the hardest faith work you'll ever do Am, is it just me am I is that is it hard to govern yourself when, when, when God says, be still and know I'm God? And all this other stuff starts competing with the knowing you're supposed to be doing. So, but my point being is, even in those seasons when God says, be still and know, trust me. Just relax, chill out. You're where I need you to be for right now. Trust me with the rest. The right door will come. The right relationship will come. The right season will change. The, I, I, I will move in my timing. I need you to trust me. Even then, that's a challenge of our faith. And I'm telling you, I know what I heard Friday. I am jealous over you. And I knew it wasn't just the Lord saying this. I knew this was to teach and release today. I'm jealous over you with godly zeal. That literally, Hebrew in the culture meant, I am passionately protective of you. Hear the voice of God's Spirit today saying that concerning your life, just like he said it to the older brother to protect the son. Somebody somewhere hearing this today, you've got the father's, you've got father level protection over what God is up to in your life. And the accusations and the ostracization that the enemy would like to affect in your life, they carry no weight in the throne room. The Father is passionately protective over you. You know what that does? That frees us up to celebrate.
let's get this party started. There's a club song. I, I got it going on in my brain, but I you know, haven't listened to it since the last time Kathy was playing it in the car. I said, my God, I'm a pastor. You can't listen to that mess. <laughs> I'm just kidding. She's probably not watching. She's on the road back from Georgia. Honey, if you're watching, we love you, and you get to preach next Sunday. So, <laughs> Oh, Lord, have mercy. Y'all clapping now. She never. Will. Who said she gonna turn around and go back to? Yeah, Kay said. Kay just. Kay knows you pretty well. Yeah, so I'll see y'all in a couple weeks. But I'm anyway. No, seriously. In all seriousness, I'm telling you because it's been a little bit since I I had something like this, uh, where the Lord just whew, and I just knew, man, God's God's so so. God is not angry at you. He is. He is radically, radically passionate about you. And his jealousy means you're his. And if we're going to do old school rap references, look at somebody and tell them you can't touch this. Oh, Lord God. Walt, let Walt get his groove on. Don't pull him back. No, do encourage him. Walt needs encouragement. Walt, get up and dance. <laughs> Listen, if Jesus is telling them they're singing and dancing, we shouldn't be seated, sitting down right now. You can't touch this. No, seriously, that's, I want you to, go, that's the takeaway today. Go home asking the Lord, what is it you want to upgrade me into that you're challenging my faith, that you've put the faith in me to grow up. You are in me, and we together will succeed at this, and I'm going to celebrate because somewhere, watch this, somewhere where I'm vulnerable, I've got divine protection. My Father is covering my life. So look at somebody and tell them you can't touch this. Can't touch this. Three things God is relentless about. His covenants his people and his purposes God is relentless and he's jealous over you I want you to stand up with me and so Judy I don't know that this would be on your personal playlist but if you will pull up uh, MC Hammer on Spotify <laughs> praise the Lord hallelujah we're getting ready to receive communion in just a moment, and I wanted to save it for this time because, you know, when Jesus is teaching about the celebration, there's a type of the imagery of communion or Passover in that story. Because what the Father is doing outside the house to keep the older brother from destroying the younger brother's future. It's a type of Passover. The Lord says, I'm jealous over you. I'll not let the death angel enter your home. At the Exodus, God's saying, I'm jealous over Israel. You're my people. So communion, they're celebrating at the Last Supper. They're celebrating the Passover meal. So what they're thinking of is that God's jealousy over Israel that protected them, that helped them come out of Egypt. That's going on in their minds. And now here Jesus is telling a story of a father. Saying to the older brother, take your tongue off of him. He's celebrating in the house. The judgment, the accusation has passed over you. So as we come today, for those who are already in faith in Jesus, you already know him. He's already alive in you by his spirit. The spirit of the Lord dwells in you. What an amazing thought. What, what, an, incre what an incredible thing. That God, God chose to live in you. That's an incredible thought. That's a mind-bending mind thing. And so we can come and say, you know what? No matter where I've been on my journey, I'm going to celebrate today, Jesus, what you did.
because you're a big brother not like that big brother you're the big brother that gave me access into the house and so we're going to celebrate the jealousy of the Lord over us today Jesus is the ultimate indication of how jealous God is over us but there may be those who are either you're watching online or maybe you're in this room and maybe you've been around church maybe you've been in a relationship with the Lord and you're not now come home there's no condemnation in the father's house there's protection in the father's house there's love and forgiveness and acceptance there's freedom there's a deliverance from the guilt and shame there is no condemnation in the father's house what say this with me what our father forgives he forgets And all of us who are in the kingdom have made that journey of surrender. But it's so important to understand our need, personal, individually, for receiving Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. That it's not a system, it's not a philosophy, it's not a religion, it's not do's and don'ts, it's Him in our hearts. Come like the younger son in your stench in your dysfunction, in your pain, in your regret, in your shame, and let the Father throw his love on you. It's as simple as saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. I am broken. I've messed it up. If I have 100 chances to do the wrong thing and 100 chances to do the right thing, I'll go 100 and 0 in the direction of the wrong thing. Those are the people God loves. Those are the people he champions. Come home today. And it's as simple as receiving him into your heart and saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. And Jesus, I just believe. I have faith to believe you are the Son of God, the only way to God. I can't go to heaven without knowing you. And you know what hell is? Hell is a lot of things. And hell, Jesus described hell as a lot of... Uh, a lot of pain, a lot of torment. It is a physical place of eternal torment. But at its worst, I think, in addition to the torment, I think at its worst, hell is the absence of the presence of the Father. Because once you're there, you're cut off from any hope. And the good news about Jesus is that he says, bring me your stuff, your sin, your record, your resume, your depravity. Come to my house, and you'll be connected to me. You see, the missing link in our lives is him. It's not stuff, it's him. So if you're watching online or you're in this room, I want to invite you to just pray this prayer with me right now. It's not the words coming out of my mouth. It's what's going on in your heart. And in that moment... The scriptures guarantee, Jesus guarantees, the moment you do this, you will be saved. That means born again, rescued, not just from old things, but from all things. All things will become new. So pray this prayer with me. Lord, I thank you that you see value in me. Even in sin, you see my value. And you love me. Not when I do everything right, but you love me at all times. And it's your love for me that moved you to send Jesus, your son, to die on the cross, to go to hell in my place, and to rise from the dead on the third day. And I believe with my heart that Jesus is the only Son of God, that He shed His blood, that I could be free from my sin and from every wrong thing I've done, from the shame, the guilt, and the burden I can never get free from. And so I confess to you today, Jesus, I am a sinner. You are my Savior, and I give you my life. 
I turn my heart over. I give myself to you. And I believe now that I am born again. And I confess the name of Jesus as my Savior and Lord. And my name's been written in the Lamb's book of life. And I have a future in heaven. I'm in the family of God. I am a new creation. And today, forward, my life will never be the same. Thank you for the free gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you've prayed that prayer, you need to let somebody know. For with your heart, you believe unto righteousness, and with your mouth, confession is made to salvation. That means you, you tell somebody. Tell somebody. You've told God, now tell somebody. If you're watching online, tell us in chat or tell us in an email. Info at metrolifechurch.us. We want to reach out to you and help you grow. I'm going to tell you, uh, you're never going to be 100% perfect. But he lives in you now and he will always be perfecting you. Put that responsibility on him and just learn to let him love on you. But we'd love to hear from you. We want to help you grow. Likewise, anybody here in the room. Maybe you've been a believer, but you've been away and you just came home. Welcome home. Instant, quick restoration. Amen. You're not out in the field for two years. Yeah. You're in the house now. Yeah. So we're going to worship the Lord with a communion table. And Jesus said, this bread represents my body, which is broken for you. As often as you do this, remember... Me. So I pray today that the broken body of Jesus that represents healing, that the Spirit of the Lord will release healing in your life wherever you need. Father, we pray you bless the bread that we partake of. We thank you, Jesus, for your brokenness that we may be made whole. Let's partake. In the book of 1 Corinthians, when Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, he called the cup cup of blessing think about that the cup of blessing Jesus became a curse so we could know the blessing of father's house so Lord we thank you today father we thank you that you've made us accepted in the beloved Jesus we thank you that you shed your blood the brutality of your murder so that we could have life so that the wrath of God would no longer be on us because you bore it yourself. Thank you for washing us clean from all sin, from all iniquity, and from all unrighteousness through the power of your blood. Thank you that even in this moment, from the mercy seat, the blood speaks. And we bless you, Jesus, for it. In Jesus' name, let's partake. In the words of how we opened service today with worship, the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. And watch for little clues and indications and signs and wonders to begin to spring forth in your life that God's being jealous over you. Amen. We love you. Have an amazing afternoon. For online, thanks again for being here. Have a great week. We'll see you Tuesday at Ava's house. Ken,